This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Consider this show the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings after party. I promise it's more fun than it sounds. Here's what we got for y'all. Political campaigns are making their way into video games to connect with voters during an election season when person-to-person -person outreach is ill-advised. Plus, while we wait for a coronavirus vaccine, vaccine hesitancy is emerging as a global threat. But first, here's what you need to know right now. If I'm confirmed, you would not be getting Justice Scalia, you would be getting Justice Barrett. Today we learned a little bit more about Judge Amy Coney Barrett as she worked to form her own judicial identity separate from the justice she's been compared to, Antonin Scalia. During the second day of her confirmation hearings, each member of the Senate Judiciary Committee had a chance to directly question Barrett 30 minutes at a time. Many of the questions centered around health care and abortion. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? So, Senator, I do want to be forthright and answer every question so far as I can. I think on that question, I, you know, I'm going to invoke Justice Kagan's description, which I think is um, perfectly put. When she was in her confirmation hearing, she said, that she was not going to grade precedent or give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Barrett also refused to indicate how she would rule on a case involving the Affordable Care Act. Still, Republicans have been open about their hopes for the court striking down the law, and Democrats suspect Barrett's appointment to the Supreme Court could be a tipping point on the issue. Senators will each get another round of 20-minute questioning tomorrow, with the committee vote tentatively planned for Thursday before the confirmation goes to the full Senate. Two COVID-19 vaccine trials are now on hold after stumbles in testing. Johnson & Johnson's candidate is the latest after a trial participant became sick. The company did not say whether the sick person received the experimental vaccine or a placebo. As we've covered before in the show, temporary holds on large medical studies are relatively common. No cause for alarm, basically. AstraZeneca's vaccine trial is still paused in the U.S. for the same reason as the Food and Drug Administration investigates. In other countries, the AstraZeneca trial has already resumed. Johnson & Johnson, which just began its phase three trials last month, has at least one advantage over the others. It's the only vaccine candidate that requires just one dose and doesn't need to be frozen before using. We know by now that reinfection of COVID-19, basically contracting it again after getting over it a first time, is possible. And this week we learned of the first documented case of this in the US, as an otherwise healthy 25-year-old man from Nevada contracted COVID-19 a second time. There have been 22 documented cases of COVID-19 reinfections across the world, but it could be a lot more common than we think. Infectious disease experts say respiratory infections don't typically provide lifelong immunities. And when it comes to COVID-19, COVID-19, some people may not even show symptoms, meaning they would never know if they were infected for the first time or a second. Unfortunately, other people, like that 25-year-old from Nevada, can get it twice and can get even sicker the second time. Researchers still can't figure out what causes symptoms to get worse, but health experts say just knowing it's a possibility means even those of us who have already gotten the virus shouldn't assume that we're in the clear. The coronavirus has drastically shifted this election season. More people are eligible to vote by mail than ever before. Drive-by rallies are a hit for anyone with an industrial-sized flag and PVC pipe. And political outreach has gotten pretty creative. Newsy's new series, Next Level, looks at how games are changing the world. In this next installment, Newsy's Matt Pick examines how politics are permeating the world of video games during this pandemic. Election season in the U.S. has been a little different this year. The pandemic has made traditional get-out-the-vote drives more risky, forcing political campaigns to turn to digital methods of campaigning. See you on the next Team Trump Online. With that in mind, campaigns are going further than ever to reach out to voters through gaming, using the virtual worlds of video games for a new kind of political mobilization. Gaming's biggest moment on the campaign trail came in early September, when the Biden campaign released officially sanctioned yard signs and clothing patterns for use in the video game Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing became a viral sensation when it was released in March 2020, back when social distancing began to really kick in. The game drew attention from some politicians back then as well. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, as well as some candidates from Florida's Democratic Party, experimented with using the game for voter outreach. 
but the Biden campaign's fairly extensive catalog of official in-game signs represent a new level of outreach, trying to get Animal Crossing players to redecorate their island for Biden. There's plenty of user-generated content supporting President Trump, despite no formal products from the campaign itself. In the past, people have tried to sell products in video games based on the demographic that that um, game reaches. Elena Bertozzi is a professor of game design and development at Quinnipiac University. Knowing that Animal Crossing has this ethos as a pro-social sort of community-oriented game, I think the Biden campaign chose that game both because they wanted to be associated with the culture and also because they wanted to reach the demographic of players of that game. Political advertising in games isn't unheard of. I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. Former President Barack Obama's 2008 campaign purchased digital billboards in games like NBA Live to try to boost turnout among young voters. But it's not clear how effective such tactics are. Like other forms of advertising, video game companies can still be enigmas when it comes to assessing how influential their content is. The prolonged social distancing needed to fight the pandemic has left over half of the country feeling more isolated and lonely than ever before, according to a Newsy Ipsos poll. With real-life options limited, Americans have been adopting more virtual methods to mingle, including by playing more video games. Animal Crossing gives its players a uniquely tangible outlet for socializing with their friends. You can't bop someone over the head with a net in a Zoom call, after all. And as election season has ramped up, the game's players have brought their political identities into their virtual lives as well. Asserting identity, political or otherwise, is a key part of Animal Crossing's attraction. The ability to take a digital space and customize it to your liking makes the game unique. Animal Crossing and other games kind of like it are playful spaces and they are interactive. So they allow us to actively engage with others and have these shared experiences in ways that you don't have necessarily if you're sitting on Zoom. Dr. Rachel Cowart runs the nonprofit group Take This, which studies games from a mental health perspective. She says the game offers something people aren't getting from other methods of digital interaction. It sounds like there's something is unique about like being in a game together. They give us a sense of control, a sense of autonomy, that we are free to make our own choices. They give us a sense of competence, that we're able to achieve things or be successful. And they give us a sense of relatedness, connecting to one another, whether it's online play and connecting with our friends, or like an Animal Crossing, connecting with our villagers. Ultimately, Animal Crossing is appealing because of the contrast it draws to the real world. Bringing political allegiances into the game is just another way for players to exert control over the digital space that they might be lacking in the real world. We're very socially isolated. We are feeling a little out of control, right? We can't really control our environment. So what better game to have than one where you're creating your own island, your own house, your own land, your own little society. Turns out that an aversion to vaccines is something shared across the world. Well? Hello, new gadget, and goodbye money. Today, Apple unveiled the next iteration of its iconic smartphone, the iPhone 12, and the 12 Pro, and the 12 Max, each with their own special features. Apple's offering each in five different colors. The release event led by Apple CEO Tim Cook looked a little different, what with the empty auditorium and all. But he had a few bragging points, including the phone's ability to connect to the speediest wireless networks via 5G. Today is the beginning of a new era for iPhone. Today, we're bringing 5G to iPhone. The new iPhones will not come with headphones or a power adapter though. The company said they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint and many customers already have those items. I tell you, 2020 just keeps taking away from us. One more big headline here is that this iPhone is smaller and thinner than the iPhone 11, a reversal on a years long trend of bigger and bigger iPhones and a return to phone dimensions more akin to that trusty old iPhone 4 I actually have buried in a drawer somewhere. Thousands of people waited for hours, sometimes more than 10 hours, to cast their vote in Georgia as early voting began this week. A 
record high turnout caused long lines at several polling places across the state. Voters have been returning mail-in ballots for weeks, but Monday marked the first day of early in-person voting. The Secretary of State's office said more than 125,000 voters cast their ballots Monday, the most to ever do so on the first day of early voting. Things haven't been looking good for movie theaters this year, but today AMC got candid saying it could run out of cash by the end of the year. The company has reopened most of its theaters, but attendance is still down about 85% compared to last year. This comes as more studios reconsider their distribution options during this pandemic. More recently, Disney announced its latest Pixar movie, Soul, will skip its theatrical release next month and arrive directly on Disney Plus Christmas Day. <laughs> I did it! I got the gig! Last week, Regal and Cineworld Theaters announced their indefinite closure and cited a lack of major movies opting for theatrical release. Back in August, Gallup released polling information that said one in three Americans would not get a free FDA approved vaccine if it was presently available. I don't know if I've ever used the word gobsmacked in a sentence, but that was my reaction. The thing is, vaccine hesitancy is real and it exists for a number of reasons. And it's not uniquely American. Newsy's Kat Sandoval looks into vaccine hesitancy around a coronavirus vaccine and how it is a global threat. Experts say a number of people are skeptical of science-based medical preventions to viruses. It's called vaccine hesitancy, and it's especially dangerous when it comes to COVID-19. Vaccine hesitancy is certainly a global threat. Um, it hasn't always been that way, but in the current hyper-connected environment, public sentiments are spreading rapidly and and widely. Not only is the coronavirus spreading rapidly across the globe, but thanks to social media, so is misinformation that can lead to mistrust. Facebook recently announced they will reject global ads that discourage people from getting a vaccine. To stop the spread of the coronavirus, at least 60% of the world's population needs to be immune, and we can achieve this through vaccines. But vaccine hesitancy can stop people from taking vaccines in the first place. Vaccine hesitancy has existed before around older, proven vaccines. But newer vaccines are new, and with that comes a lot of unknowns. This was also true for the H1N1 vaccine. Mm. The newness was, was a key reason for people not really wanting to take it yet. The World Economic Forum Ipsos poll surveyed almost 2,000 people in 27 countries. They found that 74% are willing to take a vaccine and 26% aren't. It varies in different countries. People in China were more likely to accept the vaccine than people in Russia. There is also all the rumors and misconceptions that are flowing around social media. Everybody is producing a video. Everybody has his online TV. Robert Kinwagi works with the Ebola vaccine deployment and acceptance in Africa and sees social media as being one of the factors for misinformation when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccines. I can say and the issues being expressed in the American media are not very different from the issues being expressed by communities here in Africa. Is it a business? Is it a political tool? Kanwagi says on a global stage, he sees more government officials and businessmen touting vaccines than health experts, which can make it appear to be about politics or business. If the Trump administration approves a vaccine before or after the election, should Americans take it and would you take it? If the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it, absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should that we should take it, I'm not taking it. The fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine, exactly. if the vaccine emerges during the Trump administration, I think is is unconscionable. The experts say the fact that we don't have an approved working vaccine feeds skepticism. When a vaccine or vaccines are developed, we will have more information that can help dispel rumors. But the time to build trust is now. If we engage people in the communities we're trying to reach with a COVID vaccine, co-create the outreach with them, but start doing it now. Kat Sandoval, Newsy, Chicago. 
We're gonna give you a moment to let that marinate while I count backward from 1,000. 999, 998. Europe's second wave of the coronavirus is cresting, with several countries across the continent set to implement new restrictions. But as we've seen stateside, as restrictions tighten, so does resistance to those measures. Newsy's Ben Shamiso has more. All over Europe, governments are imposing new restrictions as cases of the coronavirus continue to surge on the continent. We are today simplifying, standardizing, and in some places, toughening local rules in England. In England, Prime Minister Boris Johnson introduced on Monday a three-tier national system that shuts down pubs, gyms, and betting shops in Liverpool, the only city in the very high-risk category for now. <laughs> In France, authorities are adding more major cities to their maximum alert list, forcing bars, cafes and gyms in Paris, Marseille and elsewhere to temporarily close. Vraiment, ça me fend le cœur bah, qu'ils doivent refermer encore une nouvelle fois. In the Madrid region, non-essential travel in and out of the capital in nine suburbs has been prohibited. Es que ya es un mareo todo que no tenemos ni idea de qué hacer, qué no hacer. The tightening of restrictions comes amid growing COVID-19 fatigue. Health experts say an increasing number of people are running out of patience with the ever-changing and often confusing rules. I can't see people tolerating another nine months of this. I really can't. Dr. Chris Smith, a virologist at Cambridge University, says governments should come up with carefully balanced guidelines that keep countries as open as possible while keeping the virus under control. How much virus can we tolerate spreading? He warns against imposing measures that people already hurt economically or mentally would deem too repressive, especially if they are announced without an exit strategy. We really do have to look at this quite carefully as to what we're willing to do before, quite literally, the pill becomes worse than the ill. Ben Chamiso, Newsy. Since we're going to be here a while, feel free to enhance your social media experience by giving us a shout at hashtag Newsy in the loop. If it's a hate follow, just don't tell me. We're 21 days away from this year's general election, and by now you should probably have a good idea as to how you're going to cast your ballot. This year, a high demand for absentee ballots has put pressure on many local officials. In Virginia, they're also contending with last-minute changes to the state's elections process. Our new series, Counted On, tracks that process, and in our first installment, reporter Lauren Knapp goes behind the scenes with a Virginia registrar as she works with her small staff to secure elections for her county. I don't think that anybody recognizes what is put into an election. It is not just a two-day-a-year job. It takes months of preparation, and I think people don't realize how much we are guided by Virginia election law. Section of the code is over 500 pages now and we have to do everything and we can't let a single ball drop through the entire process. Elections officials say they've worked all day processing ballots. Polls open here at 8 o'clock this morning. This is the longest early voting period in the entire country. Record-breaking numbers of absentee ballots. Welcome to the new election officer training for the November general 2020 election. My name is Diana Mormon. I'm the director of elections and general registrar for James City County. The theme of this slideshow is kind of new, new, new. So we had 17 pages of code that went into effect on July 1st of 2020. We also had an emergency session that significantly changed how we manage our operation. And that went into effect in September. I call it organized chaos, especially with what the legislature has put upon us for this new election. Even though we are putting in 100-hour weeks currently for any presidential election, it's typical, 
you throw in a pandemic such as this one and it kind of adds in an extra wrinkle. Masks are required for all election officers. Social distancing is absolutely required. We cannot turn away a voter if they do not have a mask on. Boxes everywhere. His ballot is in this envelope and it should be in here. Can I just open this and let him retrieve it and then... Is he it? here? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Check his ID first to make sure that it is in fact him. And I feel like I haven't talked to you at all on where we stand with anything. No, we haven't. We are the 19th largest locality in the state of Virginia. We have so many that are two-person offices. If one person goes down, that election ceases to run properly. These are ballots that people have returned to us. So they've we sent them in, so we'll process them. And if they choose not to put them in the drop box, they come in through the mail. It's at least a few hundred a day. We're doing pretty well. People are really excited about it. These processes are not like Amazon. It's not gonna happen in one day. We have to request the ballot from localities. They have to physically mail them to us. And then we have to enter them into the system. Benjamin? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Janet? Wait a minute. Every day we double check the ballots to make sure that nobody's left out. And if a ballot didn't go out today, it goes out tomorrow. Yeah. But we have to make sure that the voter wrote their name correctly. We have to make sure that they sign their name correctly. We have to make sure that their address is correct. We have to make sure that the apartment matches. We have to make sure that it's dated. All of these things take time and money. These are some of the wonderful notes that we've received from voters. There's one. This is the next one that's just fantastic. And these are polite compared to some of the ones that have been sent out across the, the, uh, the state. So I keep them as a reminder of things that work and things that don't. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna head out. Okay. Text if you need anything. Okay. In the elections world, we have so many things that are thrown at us very last minute. And nobody stops to take into consideration that we actually are real people and we have lives that happen outside of our office. And there is no backup plan for right. when a registrar goes down. Thank you. Y'all have my number if you need me. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back with more in the loop tomorrow. Same time, same place. More top stories are headed your way right now.